Can a conservative Christian accept evolution? Absolutely, like I did. The evidence would have to be strong, but guess what? It is super strong. God used evolution to create life on this planet. Today we'll look at just a little piece of that evidence, the fossil record of whales. Hey there, I'm John and welcome to my channel. We explore interesting and challenging issues in scripture and Christianity, including supposed science and religion conflicts. We strive to model responsible Christianity, which includes the proposal that the church should not be rejecting evolution. Evolution is true and it doesn't conflict with the Bible. Today we'll explore a tiny slice of the evidence for evolution, the fossil record of whales. Now first, some background. I used to be skeptical about evolution. I wasn't at all convinced that it was true. Then I decided to look into it. I mean really look into it, like go to the primary sources. I've spent my life doing research, both professionally and academically, so I'm really good at this research thing. I was shocked by how extensive and sound the evidence is. I had been told that evolution was just a theory. Well, yeah, it's a theory, like gravity is a theory. It's just as true. We can rely on it to the point where it's treated as fact for all intents and purposes. The fossil record alone was enough to convince me. The genetics closed the deal beyond any reasonable doubt. And then things like biogeography and vestigial structures and so on, they just poured icing on the cake. Now, we may not yet understand all of the hows and whys of evolution, but we can see that it happens. Now, this didn't shake my Christian faith, and it shouldn't shake yours. And look, God creating life through a process as elegant as evolution gives him at least as much glory as would direct, poof, creation. And this issue is really, really important. The church can't afford to continue to be known as a body that rejects reality on this topic, as it has with other topics in the past, like the heliocentric model of the solar system. And we can't have potential believers thinking that they have to reject reality to affirm Christian, Christian beliefs. Now, if you are a direct creationist, an anti-evolutionist, you may say, Hey, John, your PhD is not in biology, it's in economics. So what makes you think you can make this case for evolution? Well, the point is, you don't have to be a biologist to come to the conclusion that evolution is true. You just need to follow the evidence and be willing to consider the possibility that you're wrong. After all, if you're not willing to consider the possibility that you're wrong, how can you ever know that you're right? So I may not be a biologist, but what I am is a fantastic researcher. So I can do the work that you don't have time to do and pull it all together and make videos like this to help you. Okay, so let's look at just a tiny slice of the evidence, the fossil record of cetaceans, whales, dolphins, and porpoises. We'll see that based on the evidence, Either God created by evolution, or he directly created many species in an order that makes it look exactly like he created by evolution. So now, it's important to note that I'm not saying that all the creatures in this video evolved directly and immediately from the one before it. Evolution is more like a bush than a ladder, and we have just an incomplete sketch of the fossil record. What we will see, though, is that there is a pattern over time of animals in the fossil record that look more and more like modern whales. We have traditional fossils. We have traditional fossils galore. As a program note, when I display a citation on the bottom of the screen, that means that the information that I am then talking about, or the direct quote I am then using, is taken from that source. Okay, so it was long claimed that whales, being mammals, evolved from land mammals, from four-legged furry land mammals. But for a long time, there were no transitional fossils to show this, and finally, Transitional fossils were found, and we now know of a series of creatures from four-legged land mammals to modern whales, more or less following each other sequentially in time, each more whale-like than the last. Now, before we get into a detailed trail, let me provide a good short summary given by scholar Michael McGowan and colleagues. Indohyus, a land mammal, had dense limb bones for walking underwater. Then Ambulocetus had shorter hind limbs and broad feet, better for swimming. Rodhacetus had nostrils toward the top of the head, good underwater hearing, and was a good paddler. Dorodon had forelimb flippers, even smaller hind legs, and a pelvis that was detached from the spine for better swimming. Basilosaurus, as well as Dorodon, 
had the ability to stay underwater for a long time and dive deep. Fast forwarding, Odontoceti had good echolocation and Mysticeti had filter feeding with baleen. The trail is very detailed and compelling. Now we're going to go through most of those creatures and more right now. Okay, so let's look at the transitional forms. For a long time, scientists thought that whales evolved from land creatures, but hadn't found many transitional forms in the fossil record to show it. They thought that way because looking at a whale's body and biology, there are plenty of clues that their ancestors lived on land. They breathe air and nurse their young with their own milk. They also have short paddle-shaped flippers, which encase hand bones with five fingers. As embryos, whales have tiny back limbs, which disappear before birth. Now, one prime piece of evidence that they were looking for is a bone in the inner ear. There is this bone in the inner ear called the involucrum. In whales, it is rounded and thick. It is found like this in modern cetaceans, whales, dolphins, and porpoises, but in no living land animal. Scientists searched long and hard for involucrums in past extinct land animals and finally found some. Indohyus appears to be very much like the land mammal that whales can count as their ancestor, or at least it is a great candidate. It looked like a heavy set deer. The bones we have found are from 48 million years ago, but this creature may have been around for a while before that. The big clue that Indohyus is related to whales is that it had a thick involucrum, but there is other evidence as well. Its bones were denser than those of fully terrestrial mammals, which kept the creature from bobbing about in the water, and isotopes extracted from its teeth show that it absorbed a lot of oxygen from water, and that would be fresh water. Now why did it go into water? We have to speculate, but it very likely lived near streams and marshes and likely hopped into water to avoid predators and maybe to find food as well. Next up is Pachycetus, which is a little more like a whale. Now, let me start with a detail that anti-evolutionists will likely jump on and may appear to be the weakest link in my argument. The bones we have from Pachycetus are from 52 million years ago, which is 4 million years before the earliest known bones of Indohyus. Is this a problem? Not really. What likely happened is either that Indohyus lived back several million years before the specimen that we discovered lived, or both Indohyus and Pachycetus share a different, as yet undiscovered, common ancestor from which they both evolved. So let's go to Pachycetus. Instead of looking like a long-tailed deer, like Indohyus did, it had a longer jaw and looked more like a wolf. And it was more adept at being in water, as anyone who owns a Labrador Retriever, a relative of wolves, knows. It had a long, powerful tail, good for swimming. We think it spent the majority of its waking time in freshwater streams and ponds. It did have an involucrum, involucrum, of course, like every animal in this chain. It could not hear underwater, but its skull exhibited changes in ways that set the stage for underwater hearing in later creatures. Now, as we would expect from this initial foray into water, Pachycetus was awkward in the water. With long legs and the spine of a land animal, it would not be a good swimmer. It would have had to do the doggy paddle to get around. So Pachycetus was only partially suited for living in water. Now next up is Ambulocetus. This appears a little later, closer to today, in the fossil record. As far as appearance, Ambulocetus was a fair bit larger than Pachycetus and looked in some ways like a crocodile with an elongated head, although no scales. Instead, it may have had hair like a modern seal. A key change here is that Ambulocetus shifts toward a saltwater lifestyle. It spent time in both fresh and salt water. It drank both. It was also a better swimmer. Its hands and feet were in between land animal feet and flippers. It had a larger, stronger tail than Pachycetus did. Indeed, its expanded hands and feet were almost certainly webbed, and it probably swam by undulating its spine to a limited degree and paddling with its feet. Now, next up in time and development is a group of species known as Remingtonocetids. They looked a bit more like whales, with longer snouts and shorter limbs. They were better swimmers than Ambulocetus, as the lower back was more flexible, which made undulating in water easier. And their tails were thick and long. These limbs were still weight-bearing, so they still could, and in all likelihood did, 
walk on land. They likely lived similar lifestyles to modern sea otters. Another advancement of Remington Ocetids is that they completely left fresh water behind. They spent their water time exclusively in salt water. We have evidence that they only ingested salt water. The next group of creatures in the chain, closer in time to today and more like today's whales, is a, gr is a group called the Protocetids. They hunted in the water, salt water, where they spent all their time, their water time. Their prey lived in salt water. They still had limbs, but the limbs were not weight-bearing, so they couldn't walk on land, but they would flop around, much like modern seals, sea lions, and walruses. But they still spent time on land, at least to give birth. They couldn't give birth in the water. The eyes were on the side of the head, facing outward instead of straight ahead, and this is like modern whales. Now what about swimming? There were advancements there as well. The pelvis was less strongly coupled to its spinal column, permitting the first kind of flexibility for tail-driven propulsion in whales. Whereas prior, the tail merely supplemented leg-powered propulsion, now the tail became the main driver of locomotion. Next up is Bacillosaurus, closer in time to us and much more like a modern whale. And they were huge, up to 75 feet long, and mostly tail. They looked sleek and eel-like, but with the tail fluke and flippers. And these guys left land behind for good. They, looked, they took to the seas and swam all around the world, as we, see, uh, as we see their fossils in lots of places. Now they still had small legs, with knees and toes, however. These were what are called vestigial structures, which means any trait in an organism that is reduced in function when compared to similar structures in other organisms. The topic is not for this video, but we need to pause on it a moment here. They still had feet! and legs with knees. Now, these were useless for walking or swimming. Indeed, the legs were very small, such that they could not possibly have supported the body on land, and could not have assisted in swimming either. But they hadn't gone away completely yet. Why didn't they completely disappear? They found another use. They were likely used in the act of mating. Direct creationists say that because they had a use, in this case as copulatory guides, that supports the view that God directly created them with legs for that purpose. But why would God create copulatory guides that looked exactly like miniature legs? It is much more likely uh, that the legs stuck around in a much smaller form because they were co-opted for another purpose. Moving on, there were lots of other changes evidenced in Bacillosaurus. For example, the nostrils were halfway between the tip of the nose and the forehead. The elbows could lock, which helped with swimming, but inside the fins were still five fingers. And it could hear underwater really well, unlike other creatures. But it was not yet a modern whale. For example, it still had a neck, it could not echolocate, and it had differentiated teeth and a relatively small brain. Now, it was a fierce predator. It ruled the ancient seas. It was a true sea monster. It is thought that it had a stronger bite force than any other mammal, living or extinct. What did Bacillosaurus eat? Anything it wanted to. One thing it wanted to eat was Dorodon. A Dorodon was quite a bit smaller than the giant Bacillosaurus, but was still a respectable size. It was different from Bacillosaurus in one other important way, the way it swam. Whereas Bacillosaurus swam by undulating its body, Dorodon, in contrast, propelled itself with its fluke like a torpedo, like a, like modern, and like modern whales. It could do this because of a particular trait first seen it earlier than Dorodon, but really put to good use now, the pelvis had detached from the spinal column, freeing up the lower spine to, pro to power greater tail movement. After Bacillosaurus and Dorodon, whale species proliferated, and evolution went off on two separate paths. One path was toward modern toothed whales and relatives, like sperm whales, porpoises, and dolphins. And the other path led to the emergence of modern baleen whales, such as blue whales, gray whales, right whales, and so forth. And so now we get to the modern day. One last question that is worth pausing to consider is how toothless whales, which have baleen, got their baleen. It certainly seemed like a big leap. A Bacillosaurus and Dorodon had teeth. Blue whales have baleen. How did that happen? Well, it appears to have happened gradually. First, there were older whales that had teeth but not baleen. Then there were whales that had both teeth and baleen. And then there were whales that just had baleen. 
Also note that in today's baleen whales, the embryos have, at an early stage, tooth buds. Those tooth buds retract at a later embryonic stage of growth. So I think fossil whales present really good evidence for evolution. We see step-by-step -step changes in the record connecting Indohias to today's whales. Of course, there is genetic evidence as well, but we're just exploring the fossil side of things here today. And so it seems that either God directly created all of these species in an order that makes it look exactly like evolution took place, or else he created modern whales by an evolutionary process. The latter choice seems much more likely to me. Well, that's it for this video. If you like the content, please hit the like button and consider subscribing. Until next time, God bless.